So just to explain, Bill will be back, so that's sort of a, he's inadvertently become a teaser for the next part of the program. But the, um, <laughs> so that also lets me give a warning. So I, I've been actually asked to give like a mini talk um, so to open this up, um, and then we'll call the panel up and uh, we'll hopefully have a, just an open discussion. There's not prepared remarks per se. I'll be giving an opening question. We'll have a conversation. We'll um, open it to the, the audience as well. So I, I just wanted to give um, some ref reflections on some things that I heard this morning and then uh, some things that might be a little bit of an intro to the, <clears throat> the session we're going to have. So again, uh, uh, Tamar talked about how everyone had been talking about media and she was the first media person we had up. So at least implicitly, everyone's been talking about politics and I think I'm the first political person who's been up. So I, as I said, worked, spent 20 years on Capitol Hill and now with um, an NGO, again, on whose behalf I'm not speaking here. Um, and um, so just some reflections on sort of from, from that point of view and, and also from someone whose uh, background is in, in history. So also one of the perspectives we haven't heard from yet. So first, I, a couple of just sort of random thoughts that, that occurred to me that hopefully are some help. So one talking about <clears throat> the public, I just remember the Elizabeth Colbert when she was still a reporter for the New York Times before she went to the New Yorker, um, in the early days of using um, focus groups for politics, she was invited to one of them. And I always remember she said, it was like going to a seminar in which no, none of the students had done the reading. Um, and I think you know, that's actually in some ways a good way to think of the public. You know, not uneducated, not uninterested, but they haven't necessarily done the reading. So that's, um, which linked to another quote that I was um, thinking of, which is from the great essayist E.B. White, so, who said that democracy is nothing more than the recurrent suspicion that more than half of the people are right more than half of the time. Um, which is, again, getting back to some of Roger's uh, statements and others that, you know, if you're going to have faith in the system, that's really what it is. And the, and the, and the third one, which is um, something that I sometimes say, which is all you need for politics is two people and a choice, right? So it's, it's, not, um, it's not some dirty game, although it obviously can be. It's just the inevitable thing that happens if you have two people and a choice. And so there's really, it is unavoidable, as uh, a number of people have pointed out today. So, um, in hearing the talks today, one thing that um, disturbed me, which often does in hearing these talks, and I think they outline a number of really important points, some of which I will be underscoring, is that they take place in a snapshot in time. Uh, Tamara and some other people submit, but what matters is what happens over time, right? And so um, this notion that um, facts don't matter at all, or I think is both dangerous and actually overstating, you know, it's an overcorrective for the notion of the de deficit model and all these things. And actually, most of the people who um, are correcting the deficit model actually have in their head, right, still this, as Roger talked about, wish that there would be a world where facts were all that mattered. That's clearly not the way the world has ever worked. Um, but the idea that facts are irrelevant, I think, is actually a gross overstatement and, and a dangerous one. The thing that makes it tricky is, we don't know when and how and which facts are going to matter at any one time. And they're not going to matter all the same time to all the same people. And there's going to be some groups to whom they may not matter, right? And then we tend now, because of a kind of um, almost institutionalized cynicism, to assume those are, the one, those are the people that matter most, the ones to whom facts matter the least. When it may be that the people in the middle or the people who are going to, who we can't necessarily predict which one, who are going to be the leaders for what's going to change over time, they're the ones to, for whom facts do matter. So I think, I just want to, hopefully that will partly dispel some of the, the gloom, even though I somehow ended up dressing in a dark suit today, but, the, um, but I think it both complicates it and I think is, um, makes it a little less one-dimensional. Facts matter how, when, why, to whom, that's the question. And for the things that we care about most, again, change over time, especially sort of epical change, things that make the world really look entirely different, happen when these snapshot things get all scrambled up, which doesn't mean they're not valid, but it means they can alter, right? And so um, they can either alter because of the facts. So even if you look at climate change, 
the fact that we're debating climate change is because scientists introduced the issue and it has changed over time and action is not actually the same point as it was even if Congress doesn't entirely reflect that. Um, but it can also change because of the underlying perceptions, which can mean that people move among the boxes that Dan has them in. So often when I'm trying to students or other groups, I'll point out sometimes, you know, the stereotype is the, or the um, simplified story, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire in the late 1960s, and as a resu result, we had the Clean Water Act in 1972. There's enough people sort of of my age and older here that that won't come as a complete mystery, right? So. Um, Maybe others still have copies of Life magazine somewhere in their basements that have the picture. But um, so it turns out the Cuyahoga River caught on fire almost every summer for decades, right? I mean, this wasn't a spill. This was stuff that was dumped regularly in the river, and it caught on fire when it got hot. Um, what changed in the late 1960s was people suddenly thought, A, this is a bad thing. And B, this is a thing we can do something about. And that, and that doing something about it takes precedence over other concerns. Um, that's an epical shift that meant all those boxes got sort of shifted around. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gotten um, environmental legislation. And there's lots of examples of it. The, the other case example I often use is if you look at from the turn of the 20th century, um, I'm not going to use slides, by the way. <laughs> by the turn of the 20th century, um, <clears throat> Many towns and villages had um, anniversary celebrations, and they all had this similar iconography, a two hills and a valley. You would have thought the entire country was over Rift Valley. And the, um, on one cliff was an Indian sort of looking, you know, there were noble savages in the stereotype by then, sort of looking peacefully and somewhat longingly over to the other cliff that had a factory and smoke billowing out of smokestacks. And to everybody around 1900, that was a simple picture of progress. You show the same picture to people in 1970, and at least half the people would have thought that was a narrative of environmental degradation, right, without changing a thing. What happened there, right? Um, so, um, so change matters. Facts and emotions matter for change. Um, so I just want to, again, sort of maybe complicate, further complicate some of the picture we heard this morning. The other thing I wanted to talk about was um, more specific about the, the way science and policy intersect. And we all have these typologies. I have this um, sort of group of four that maybe is helpful. Now, admittedly, this is based in part on the notion that you can, to some degree, set, separate the scientific issues from other is the natural and physical science issues and policy making from some of the others. It's more murky than that, as many people have pointed out. But I don't think it's so murky that there is no um, point in thinking about them separately. And so I think there's, you basically have four different kinds of intersections. The first one um, I call a, a policy issue masquerading as a science issue. And I should step back, actually, to make the main point about this, which is people often bemoan the politicization of science. Roger had a sort of a friendlier way to define that. But um, the term that's usually a phenomenon that's bemoaned but often what's actually happening, at least as often, is what I call the scientization of politics. So what this is, is because of the point that Dan um, illustrated well, that the public actually holds science, science and scientists in high esteem, if anything, exaggeratedly high, ex high esteem rather than low. The goal of everybody in a policy debate on all sides is to say it's a question of science. Because if you can say science is on your side and convince people of that, you win, right? Um, and so in an especially polarized time like we have now, that's the phenomenon even more so. Everyone wants to say it's science and the facts speak for themselves, and therefore you're with me or you're wrong. Um, and so again, the, now getting to the typology, the first case is, again, a policy issue masquerading as a science issue. These are issues where there's actually no science. The science actually has, is decided, in effect, you've got a pure policy decision. So um, for certain air pollutants, not for all of them, where the science is pretty well determined, this was true of where, for example, uh, concerns about smog were in the 1990s, not so much anymore. Um, there was clear debate about a clear understanding of at X level of air pollution, you got X level of 
Y level of excess hospital admissions. So where do you set the target? Nobody want, you know, you could, the real debate is how many hospital admissions are acceptable, right? How many politicians wanted to engage in that debate? Zero, right? I mean, there is, that is a debate you cannot possibly win. Um, so everybody the, just engaged in a debate about what's the scientific number to set this at. The scientific advisors who had given a range, there were some numbers that clearly were not, science, were not allowable under the law, um, started by saying, you know, that's a policy issue. But after a while, the debate got so angry, so heated, that they basically took sides based on their feelings about uh, health policy. And the debate became a huge issue that actually continues to this day. There's actually still bills being introduced in Congress related to that fight. Um, the next, the next uh, category I'd say is there's a policymakers are asking a scientific question and there's a fairly broad scientific consensus answer. So climate change is the most obvious example of this. The, qu the problem with this is people think of this as the standard situation when it's extremely unusual, right? And climate bulk so large in our debate of these things, partly because of the impact of the issue, partly because it aggravates everybody, but it's actually, in terms of the profile of it, it's an outlier, um, where people are debating purely, a policymakers and elected officials are develop debating a purely scientific issue. Scientists actually have a codified answer, and it just goes on and on and on. I mean, none of those things usually obtain. Um, I could. If I had the full 25 minutes, I'd go into why that's true about climate. But the point is, that's one category. It's actually not so common, but it's the one everyone dwells on. The most common is policymakers are um, asking a question that's at least partly re related to science, and the science is relatively all over the place. Um, that's what happens most of the time. One can argue about not so much GMOs and health, but arguably maybe about GMOs and uh, ecology, the two uh, scientists that Tamara said, you know, the facts speak for themselves, which were wildly different places. When there were three physicists in Congress, they used to hang together and talk about science knows everything and be the physics caucus, but the Republican in that group, even though it was a moderate Republican, voted totally differently from the two Democrats of the group, right? So um, there are lots of issues like this. The ones related to ecology are especially likely, because it's a relatively young science, are especially likely to offer a range of answers that can never catch up with the policymakers' questions. But you've got to draw the line somewhere, right? And what to do in the face of uncertainty, that's a values question. That's not a science question. Um, sometimes point forestry questions seem especially like this. They're, you know, even though we've been clambering around in forests for a long time, I was saying that at one talk once, and afterwards, during the break, two guys came up and they said, we're from the Forest Service. And I said, and? And they're like, yeah, it's kind of true. So I still say it. Um, uh, and again, people use this as a, policymakers often use this as a distraction. So one, po one forestry debate I was involved in while on Capitol Hill, there was this huge debate about what treatments of a forest after a forest fire are most appropriate. The science was all over the map, but the problem with the bill was actually that the bill said all bet, you know, you can do anything under special circumstances, and then to our view, define special circumstances as any day when it wasn't 80 degrees and sunny. That's what should have been debated, is the way the bill was being written, but everyone had a fight about the science to the degree of some poor graduate student actually had to appear in front of a congressional committee and have a fight with <clears throat> one of the members about statistical analysis. Um, the last topic, uh, the last category is issues that are new enough that everything is up for grabs. Um, at one point, and maybe still, um, Jason would have a better sense, the, the uh, uh, environmental consequences of nanotechnology fit in this. And you could tell because uh, environmental groups, industry, Republicans, Democrats, all said what we want is more science. Um, they had different biases in terms of what they thought that was going to produce, but that was sort of the fallback for everybody. I just want to say you can tell um, an issue in Washington isn't fully mature yet because the debate is less immature 
Um, so people are not just yelling at each other yet. They're actually, you know, well, we don't know exactly where this is going to lead. Everyone should give us some data. The little bit of the catch-22 on that is then when you get to a point when people are ready to fight, sometimes people will say, well, I don't really trust that data because it was done with re the research was done with regulation in mind. Um, which is, of course, what everyone had been calling for earlier, but then there's a sense that, oh, well, if it wasn't just done with no result in mind, that it's not really uh, valuable, and so there's a little bit of a, a problem there. But I think if we, as we're talking about these issues, and uh, we're going to look a little bit about GMO labeling, although we're going to talk more broadly than that, um, which category does this fit in, or which categories, how does that affect the role of scientists and what do scientists do when they're being treated as if they determine the debate when, and maybe think that themselves, when actually the more salient issues, or at least part of it, is values, economics, uh, other issues other than the physical and natural sciences. So I just want to lay that out before we start. So now I'll call the panel up, and we'll begin our discussion. So I wanted to, uh, wanted to start with a, a broad question for um, all our speakers here, which relates to what we've been hearing, which is in the GMO labeling debate or in the GMO debate more broadly, uh, and I'm also going to ask each of them to introduce themselves as they begin to answer um, or reintroduce themselves in some cases. Um, what is, given what you've heard today and the complexities you know from actually participating in this, what is the role of the scientist? How do you, um, how do you navigate um, this question of when everyone's trying to draw you in and be the factual spokesman? Uh, and is there anything you heard today that either rings true, rings wrong, that might alter how you do this, or that you hope never alters the way anyone does this? So why don't we start, Bob? I'm Bob Goldberg. I am a plant molecular biologist. I'm at UCLA. Uh, I've been making genetically engineered plants in my lab for 40 years and genetically engineered crops over that period of time. And the labeling issue is uh, a really emotional issue, as I found out firsthand. Uh, I cannot tell you how many emails that I get uh, threatening to burn down my house, threatening to slash my tires, uh, individuals showing up in my department head uh, office uh, wondering why I'm on the faculty of UCLA. And so I've learned uh, really firsthand being in the trenches of this issue how extremely emotional it is and how uh, perceptions of the public uh, really affect and frame the issue. Having said that, I view my role as a scientist uh, and as someone who's really worked hands-on in this area to present as clearly as I can some of the history of genetic engineering and provide some of the facts in terms of the safety and the studies that have been done uh, along with a range of other issues uh, and, and view it in a way in which uh, I can communicate to the public in ways in which they can understand in a non-technical way uh, why this issue really is uh, one to be uh, not so concerned about, uh, but yet I can understand what their concerns are. So I have a couple of answers. Well, I should introduce, introduce myself, actually. So I'm Bill Hallman. I'm a chair and professor of the Department of Human Ecology at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. <laughs> and uh, everybody asks what human ecology is about. Human ecology it, at, at Rutgers, uh, we are an interdisciplinary social science department. I'm a psychologist. My colleagues are, are anthropologists, sociologists, geographers, legal scholars, political scientists, 
all interested in the interaction between human beings and the environment and that reciprocal relationship. So now you don't have to ask me during the, uh, the cocktail hour. Um, I should also say that I uh, currently chair the Food and Drug Administration's Risk Communication Advisory Committee. And this is an issue that might actually come before my committee at some point. I, I don't know when. Um, so I'm not making any official statements on behalf of the FDA. There we go. All right. Uh, so I have a couple of answers. Um, as a social scientist, and, I, and I'm an experimental psychologist, so I consider myself to be an empirical scientist, you know, one of the roles that I can play is to explain um, how you know, public perception research actually works and why it seems as though there are, there's no end of people who seem to represent themselves as knowing exactly what the public wants on this particular issue with absolute certainty using data that has the veneer of, of scientific credibility attached to it and why a lot of that is nonsense. Um, so I think that there is a role for people like me to explain how this is done and what the issues are. So for example, in my own research, um, I know that how I ask the question largely determines the answer I get back. So when we talk about labeling, when we ask about labeling, if we ask it, uh, if we ask people, how often do you read food labels? Uh, people lie and they say that they read food labels a lot more often than we know that they actually do from observational studies. Do you think they know they're lying or that's their sense of what they should do or say, Say a little bit more it's about a, what they're... It, it's a combination of telling you what they think that they should say to you. Um, again, they're trying to figure out how they're going to be perceived by you, and so they're no, they know that they're supposed to read labels, and so they tend to overestimate the amount that they do that. So they're not maybe not necessarily consciously lying, but they're presenting themselves in the best light, be that as it may. If you then go and, and ask them, is there anything else that should be on a food label that's not already there? what percentage of the population volunteers GMO labeling. Um, in our most recent study, I showed you some of the data this morning, it's about 7% on their own, without prompting, without mentioning GMOs first or biotechnology, on their own, so about 7%. If you ask them straight up later on, should GMOs be labeled, you get 73% if you allow them to say, I don't know, you get 90% if you force them to make a choice, yes or no, which is consistent with a lot of the other studies that are out there, which are flogged by lots of organizations who you know, would like to have, you know, to, to suggest that there is this groundswell of support. If you ask it a third way, if you ask from this list of things, how important are these things to be on a label, what you end up with is about 63% saying that they think country of origin is an important or very important thing to be on a label. Uh, consumers say they want to know about whether pesticides are being used in the production of this product, whether hormones are being used, whether antibiotics are being used. GM is about sixth or seventh on the list at about 59%. So the question then is, what percentage of the population wants GMO labeling? Is it 7%? Is it 59%? Is it 73%? Or is it 90%? And the answer is, well, it depends on how you ask the question. And one of my proudest moments as an academic was I had, had uh, a grant from the US Department of Agriculture in the mid-2000s where we've, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. We asked a similar kind of question. Then it was about between 1% and 3% who volunteered that they wanted GMO labeling. This is about 2004. And we still got the 9 and 10 response. And we put out a press release saying, Exactly this. Depend, it depends on how you ask the question. If you ask it straight up, you get 9 and 10. If you ask people, is there anything else that should be on a label without mentioning GMOs and framing it for them, you get about 3%. So the next day, on the Greenpeace website, we find Rutgers study finds, you know, 3%, oh, sorry, 90% of the American uh, public wants GMO labeling. The very same day, on Monsanto's website, 3% of the American population <laughs> wants GMO labeling. And literally, they were part of the same sentence in the press release. So I think part of our role is to explain you know, how, this, how this works, especially to, to policymakers. So I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Lots of potential follow-up, but we'll keep going tomorrow. <laughs>
You know, this means I have the power to mute the Monsanto guy. <laughs> so I think the role of scientists in the labeling issue is a little different from the role of scientists in sort of the larger genetically modified food uh, uh, question. Because we need to establish what's really true about genetically modified foods. We need to establish what the benefits are. We need to establish what impact it's having on the environment. Those things need to be known for policymakers, for uh, corporate scientists, for academics. F um, and then the question becomes, at what point is there an obligation to alert consumers? Or even at what point does it make sense to alert consumers? And I think that, that this discussion about um, you know, communication about labeling is, it's, it's kind of like a fractal because uh, labeling is a communication issue and, and it has some of the same problems that we've been talking about today as far as the science of science communication. And uh, what, if we make a list of the things that we think we have a regulatory requirement to provide to consumers, perhaps whether something is genetically modified is not on the list. But that's sort of where science's involvement stops and we start asking, okay, well, is there some other kind of utility in having a transparent system where people know uh, the processes that are involved in making their food. And I, you know, I think that's a very hard question, but I think it's much more of a question for, um, for social science to some extent and, and for you know, policy, because I really do think that the labeling issue is more about utility than GM science per se. You better watch yourself. Yeah, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm Eric Sachs. I'm the Monsanto guy. I've already been introduced. Um, more than that, um, I'm a plant geneticist. Um, I've worked for Monsanto my whole career, uh, 37 years and counting. Um, and I thought I'd start because I, I'm the guy at Monsanto who's been engaged in trying to communicate about this science for at least 25 years. Uh, I was part of the team that developed the first GM crops that are in the marketplace, and um, we knew we needed to do we needed to communicate. Uh, unfortunately, we're all here today because that communication didn't go so well. So, um, so I want to start with my uh, pure science moment um, for Roger. Um, you know, because my passion really started for a career in science back in 1973 in a small teaching lab in Robbins Hall at UC Davis where I was looking through a microscope, you know, essentially at the, the beauty, the structure, the function of plant anatomy. And it just captured me. That, from there forward, I was a scientist. And just like an infant, you know, I was, I was only innocent for a moment. Because after I, after I, I learned what I needed to, to learn, I went to work for Monsanto. Um, so, so again, while at Monsanto, much of my, my engagements around science, of course, is focused on other scientists on regulators, uh, on farmers, on <clears throat> you know, students, journalists, you know, and only more recently have I really started thinking about how to engage the public directly, because most of my time was in those other areas. And a lot of my work focused on examining what we call poor quality science uh, it reports and exposing their failings and really enabling others to more fully consider the reliability and relevance of, of the claims that were being made in those papers. And I, and I built a lot of external relationships around that, that exercise. So what I want to talk about is what have I learned in, in trying to do this and, and making mistakes along the way. First thing, a number of these things have already been said today. Uh, scientists don't always agree. They can look at the, evi the same evidence and come, come out with completely different points of view. And we've already learned that that has a lot to do with their, their views and their values and other things that, that are part of their makeup. Um, the other thing that's important is that science alone is not sufficient to align opinions in, in any group. We, we, we've been talking a lot about that today. Uh, the other thing is 
it's important that science does not provide answers, but it can provide relevant and reliable information to inform decision making. We, we've kind of talked around that today, but a number of people have made comments about what the science says. The science is just information. You know, it's how we interpret that information that determines our points of view on it. Again, science is an application, it's a process that, that ensures that learning and decision making can be based on sound evidence that's been tested and verified. We haven't talked too much about that either. Uh, science helps us examine alternatives because some, sometimes certain approaches are better than others and we can measure which, which is better and that, that's part of inno the innovation process and we all benefit. But often controversy exists because we choose our, um, we choose our facts to fit our views and values. We've, that's been, a, a, I think, a key point today. Rather than stretch or modify or adjust our views and values to fit the facts. And I think we need to talk more about that element of this. We all do that, we're all guilty of that, but is that good? Or do we just accept it as part of human nature? Um, so again, I'm gonna try and, with my last few remarks here, talk about, you know, because I'm in industry, we assess the situation and then we develop a plan. So what are you gonna do differently? What have you learned and how are you gonna apply it so that we can make progress? And I think the role of scientists really is to objectively enter into you know, a dialogue and help lay the foundation of information. You know, his role is not to tell people what they should believe based on the scientist's preconceived point of view. And we do that too often. Um, I think what I've heard today in some of the, the talks from, from the, the social side is that you can't avoid doing that. that. That's just the way it is. If you engage in discourse, you are going to be bringing your point of view. Um, but that gets us into trouble, because when we do that, we're oftentimes pegged as you know, advocating and then people get upset with us and ignore us and that, that model just doesn't work. Um, but I, do, I am an optimist, I do think we can do better. And I think we are learning to listen more, to consider different perspectives, to support a diversity of approaches and really communicate more openly and transparently. And we're learning largely by, I think, um, the interdisciplinary kinds of conversations that we're having, like this meeting, and I think it's important. This is about the fourth meeting like this that I've been to, and, and I, I'm continually learning uh, ways that I need to adjust the way in which I communicate. Um, I think helping understand the way people learn and think and make decisions is very relevant to a science communicator. Um, so just in my last comments, because I did prepare some things thinking about this, um, decision making that considers appropriate evidence and is built on listening and transparency and considers different perspectives will lead to better outcomes. That's my <coughs> hypothesis. We'll see whether that, that is actually true. Ultimately, science belongs to everyone. Um, scientists have a responsibility to communicate um, but they have to do it well across a multitude of, of spaces. That includes, um, you know, what they do at home, at work, on, online, and essentially to the communities that they reach. We need to listen more uh, to our, our families, friends, and communities. Listen to the questions and answer the questions. It's really, try and avoid arguing uh, the outcome, but just Step by step answer people's questions and I found that really can uh, lead to a broader and more maybe even a reframing sometimes of what people believe. And I think if we step beyond what is perceived as an ivory tower uh, within science, we can and actively engage and listen that we'll, we'll actually see that we, we can make progress moving forward. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Well, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Allison Snow. I'm a plant ecologist at Ohio State University. And I'm going to speak a little bit more about environmental effects of GMOs um, and just give you a quick background of how I got to this position of, of working on these questions. Like you, I was at UC Davis uh, in, in, in the 1980s when a lot of these crops were being developed. And I remember thinking two things as an ecologist. One, I was fascinated by the science and the elegance of it and where it was going and, and where it is now, um, so that I was really wowed by that. But as an ecologist, I also was a bit appalled at the lack of knowledge of ecology by the people that were developing the crops. And that's kind of been 
a worry of mine all through my career that maybe there are ecological questions that aren't being addressed by the people who are developing GMOs or regulating GMOs. Um, and so one of the things I really value about being an academic professor is I can investigate any question that I think is important. Um, so that's what I see as part of my role as a scientist is to ask really good questions, look for areas in ecology, in, which is my expertise, that aren't being addressed by others, um, try to do really good scientific research, communicate it in journals, um, peer-reviewed journals, and then the question of communicating that to the public, that's why we're all here today, how do you do that? Um, and it, I've had some training from the, the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program. There's some people here that are part of that program through the Ecological Society of America. Yeah, and that's been, that's been very helpful because a lot of academics like me are hesitant to speak to the press. You have one bad experience and they misquote you and you don't want to do it again, um, that kind of thing. I'm sure some of you have experienced that. So, um, but I think it's really important for us to try to translate what we found um, to people like Tamar and try to explain it and uh, from our perspective and then not shape public opinion but have those facts out there for people to use in developing their own uh, opinions. So, um, so I've always tried to listen to other points of view from industry, from NGOs. Um, I think it's especially important to listen to the questions that are being asked by NGOs and they're a very broad group, we can't generalize, but uh, I, I think that they have the public's interest in mind. That's why a lot of people go and work for these organizations and are asking a lot of really important questions that aren't really represented that much today. So I, I just want to put in a little plug for how much I have learned by having people in the NGOs ask me questions and me talking to them. As with industry, I've learned a lot from that too. Um, so I know we can't consider ourselves to be honest brokers or anything like that. Um, one of the questions was, what have we learned from this morning? And it does confirm my biases. You know, we talked about our biases are always being confirmed, but I, I am learning a lot and I think it's really good to have these discussions um, about listening to other people and challenging your own biases so that maybe you'll look at questions in a different way. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to ask uh, another broad question and maybe we'll open it up, although the, the Aldo Leopold reference, which is a great program, reminds me of tell I often tell from that, which relates to science communication. So the now they don't do it, but the Leopold Fellowship Program used to have uh, mock congressional hearing, which I was always part of the training for, and they were very, talk about different modes of communication, they were very, uh, had really hammered home that people needed to use metaphors, but they didn't always mention that not if that's more complicated than what you're actually trying to explain. <laughs> and so one of my favorite moments was a uh, young, uh, I guess she might have been a limnologist, someone, anyway, she was talking about something about pollution in her lake, and she said, um, so I have a three-year-old at home and we have this white carpet in the kitchen and I have to keep things from spilling on the carpet and this was the metaphor for something that had been relatively simple about pollution and in the, the evaluation later I said, do you actually have a three-year-old and a white carpet in your kitchen? And she said, no. I said, okay, good. Because nobody heard another thing you said, right? All we did was sit there and think, what kind of idiot has a <laughs> three-year-old and a white carpet in their kitchen? Why would I listen to them about anything, you know? And so sometimes we forget, you know, how human this is. <laughs> it's actually um, framing things in a way that only makes sense in theory will not, will not help. Um, so let me, let me put out sort of on, on GMO labeling, sort of an extreme notion um, as a way to sort of sort things out. So what if someone were to argue um, scientists have no role in the GMO, no legitimate role except as citizens in the GMO labeling debate. It's really a debate about public right to know. If people want to then have a debate afterwards about how much public should care about the label, that's fine. Maybe that gets into the science, but it's really not a science debate at at base, it's really a question about what, you know, do you want the public to make the decision or experts to put it in um, a, a framework that people have already raised. So just like to um, hear people's thoughts on that to try to sort of sort out where the science fits in. Bob, do you want to start? So, so the question is a, a really good one here. And I thought about that quite a bit. Uh, in, in terms of uh, public disclosure, I should say that I, uh, wrote the ballot arguments against labeling in California, Proposition 37. 
And one of the reasons why I did that was because I didn't think uh, that the mandatory labeling policy was good public policy. And that's where the science comes in. Uh, because the science of genetic engineering is just a process. That's all it is, is a process of manipulating genes. And we can manipulate genes by classical breeding. We can manipulate genes by adding genes from other organisms. There's a lot of sophisticated ways to manipulate genes. The way the GMOs today were manipulated that are on the market is ancient history compared to what we can do in my lab. But the point here is, is that if you're going to have a regulatory system, you want a rational regulatory system. And the National Academy of Sciences has weighed out very clearly on this, and that is that the process of genetic engineering, whether the modern way or the old-fashioned way, manipulates genes. And if you're going to label, let's say, a food on the basis of genetic manipulation, you ought to have a process that weighs both equally. So it makes no sense to have regulation of a process that might manipulate one gene because you put it into an organism and forget about all the other crops that have been and all the new varieties of plants that are being put on the market today of which there's zero regulation. I'm not sure any of you realize this. So the irony is, is that if I in my lab genetically, which I could do and a high school student could do, genetically engineer a hypoallergenic peanut, I completely knock out the allergen and it's clinically tested to be absolutely safe, much safer than any variety of peanut that you would produce classically, that's going to go through about 10 years of regulatory oversight. It may or may not get to the market. But if in a field next to UCLA, of course there isn't any, but if there were, I was to use classical genetics to breed a peanut that might have 10 times the amount of allergen that might be in a normal variety of peanut that you get in Dodger Stadium or any other baseball stadium in the United States, there's zero regulatory oversight, no push for any labeling or any kind of regulation. So I view the, the role of a scientist in this is to, again, put the facts on the table, not to make the policy, of course, I don't want to make that policy, but at least to try and engage the discussion so that if one is going to have labeling of foods in some way, that at least it's a rational policy that's based on the science, and it's not irrational, where you single out one process, which in, could in fact be safer than another process, which is completely left out of the discussion. So let me just add one, not, and then as we keep going down. And so um, first of all, I'm thinking, you know, this is a le area of research that maybe airlines want to invest in, so they don't have to worry about the peanuts on the plane. But the, um, so the, the argument that there's sort of no difference, meaning in some ways no scientific engineering difference between standard hybridization and doing direct gene manipulation is in some ways an assertion, right? Depending on what sort of values you bring to it, you could argue with that, or one could argue yeah, with I that. Yeah, I would disagree so, with that, okay. you know. And the reason I disagree with that is that I can insert a gene in a plant that might make a larger tomato, and I can measure exactly what that gene is doing over the course of the development of that tomato. And by classical breeding, I can develop the same kind of tomato right. because I'm manipulating by breeding exactly the same gene. And I can measure very precisely that activity and I can compare the two and in fact they'll come out to be almost equal. Right. And so from a biological point of view, we're not really altering what's happening inside the cell. We're just following the same kind of rules. And so I would say that it's a fundamentally similar process if you look at simply the rules of biology or the rules of how cells work. And I think that's a real challenge to communicate to the public. It's a very big challenge. Right, and you qualified that that time by, from a biological point of view. Yeah, which is, uh, exactly. Narrowing. Okay, Bill, let's keep going on this question. So as usual, I have two answers. Um, yes. yes. No. <laughs> no. no, maybe. <laughs> um, so I think that there is a role for both natural scientists and social scientists in this as, as in everything. Starting with the natural science piece, because I think that's sort of the root of your question. Mm -hmm. um, so part of the debate is if we were to have labels, what should qualify to be labeled, as, as was being suggested here? Uh, in different countries, there are threshold limits, 0.09%, for example, in the European Union. Is, that a, is, there, a, is there a science behind that? There are exceptions 
uh, processing aids, certain kinds of enzymes to make cheeses, for example, don't qualify necessarily as GM if you look at the various state laws that have been proposed, you know, a, a whole mishmash of what qualifies as GM or not. You know, can scientists actually help us answer some of these questions? Are there scientific answers or are they, you know, purely political answers? Um, so what qualifies as GMO makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, from the social science perspective, I think one of the things that we can lend um, is or, or are studies of what GMO labels would actually trigger in consumers' minds. And you know, we've done research around that. We've actually done some labeling studies. And this isn't supposed to be whether we should label it right. or not. Um, but but you know, there is data on that. And it's, it, the data suggests that there is a cascade of, of impressions that consumers get that aren't, and, and many of those ideas aren't scientifically true. So, for example, if we have the 0.09% uh, threshold, uh, that sort of frames things as though GM is a contaminant above which there's, you know, there's a problem below which there's not a problem. So there, you know, there, are issues of, there are issues of framing, there are issues of the unintended consequences of, of labeling, there are issues of um, uh, that enter into the, sort of the, the political science of this, or sorry, the regulatory science of this. So if such labels trigger th in consumers' minds things that are not true, is that not mislabeling? Right. So we have regulations that will not permit you to say things uh, that would benefit your marketing that are untrue. Should we force speech which makes companies say things which make consumers not want to buy their products. So just, um, I was hoping someone would bring that up, so that, that's, which is the flip argument. But just out of curiosity, what's the research on something like the bovine growth where the labels both label it and say, but there's no reason you should actually worry about it. Um, what's the, um, what has the research shown the effect of that is? Do the people paying attention to the don't worry about it part? Does it confuse people more? What, what happens? You would think I'd know the answer to that question, <laughs> uh, but I have to disappoint you. Okay, um, good. That's a kind of victory asking a question people don't know the answer to. Um, Eric, go ahead, and we'll go to Tamar. On that one, and and I'm I know just enough to be dangerous. So if I get this wrong, I'm sure people will point it out. Um, y your question implied that there were products on the market that were labeled uh, that the milk was produced by animals that had been treated and the, the fact of the matter is that it hasn't happened. Those products are not offered to consumers. So that kind of feeds into some of the remarks or what are the consequences of labeling that are not really intended by the labeling? I'll come back. Or they are intended but the argument is framed differently, right? Uh, Tamar. I guess I'm going to double down on the idea that this is a question of utility rather than science. Um, and. There is, there's no grand unifying theory for what goes on a label and what doesn't. If you ask, okay, well, what should we label? There's no really good answer. We label some things for some reasons and some things for other reasons. I mean, country of origin labeling has nothing to do with food safety. Um, I, and, you know, we, we label well, some vitamins. That, uh, okay, now, but I mean, in oh, the well, public now, desiring it, but might be connected to food yeah, safety. Yeah, and obviously it's a WTO issue, but um, but certainly it's something that's been seriously considered to put on a label, and the legislation is is pending. You know, we label vitamin A, but not vitamin D, I think. Um, and so, why do we pick the things that we pick and not pick the other things? And you know, let's do a little bit of a thought experiment. Okay, people don't like. There's a vocal minority that doesn't like genetically modified foods. Um, people are very attached to that grievance in some quarters. People are also, why does this keep doing this? Um, people are always attached, yeah, give me yours. Yeah. <laughs> um, people are also attached to a lot of foods that have genetically modified ingredients, like Doritos. And as long as we don't have labeling, people get to have both their grievance and their Doritos. If we were to label, we would force people to choose. They could no longer have both their grievance and their Doritos. 
Um, and it's possible that by forcing the issue and making people choose between their ideas about genetic modification and the food they feed their family, we could make all this go away. And, you know, I'm not saying that would happen, although I think there's a possibility that it would. Um, but I am saying that I think labeling is about much more than just science, and we don't have any solid answers on that very simple question, what do we put on a label and what don't we? So let me add another complication, which actually is appropriate for um, Eric and Allison comes out from what we just heard, which is what if your grievance is that other people are eating Doritos, right? And well, now there's a bunch of true. different ways that can be true, inclu <laughs> including just aesthetic. But the um, but for this purpose, if if the concern about GMOs becomes ecological, even though that ranks low on the public's list, rather than health, and then becomes one of those issues that's less like I'm going to drive a car even though it's deadly, and more like I'm in an airplane and I can't control what happens to it. Um, how does that change, you know, the role of scientists and also the whole nature of, of the debate on labeling? So, Eric, go ahead. With that or what you were going to yeah. say before I said that. No, no. I, I think it's a good question because I think at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're kind of emphasizing that different people have different reasons for maybe opposing GM and wanting to avoid it in their diet could be environmental, it could be uh, a fear of their uh, health and safety, it could be any number of things uh, produced uh, using modern techniques as opposed to more traditional ones. I mean, it, there's lots of reasons. Um, at the end of the day, the question that I always ask in, in these conversations is, what will be the outcome if we have labeling? You know, do, do your, the presumption is we'll walk, we'll go into the grocery store and all choices will be available to us. But what we've learned through the process, and we've learned this in Europe, is that is not going to happen. Food, the food manufacturers and the grocery marketers are going to put one or the other. They're not going to duplicate SKUs on every single food item in the store. So at the end of the day, we may have less choice. And so as a, as a scientist, that's really not my realm to get into that conversation directly. But I do want to understand what people's concerns are. If they're environmental, let's talk about the environmental. If their concerns are around food safety, let's talk about what we know about food safety. And try and, again, whittle away with some evidence, some things that, that people can understand, and, and then maybe, maybe they start to reframe their, their current position. So that's where I come from. It's just more about education than it is about taking a stance one way or another on labeling. Um, I guess I would just ask, echo what some people have said in that I think scientists can provide a lot of good information that people might have questions about when they're making decisions about how to vote on these topics. But I think it's not a scientific question whether you label or not. There's science, there could be scientific questions about how you arrived at your opinion. Um, so I would just like to answer the scientific questions and, and not go beyond that as a scientist. So let me... Um turn it around, and this, I'll just throw it over to see if people want to answer. So, um, and Bill already hinted at this. So let's say someone um, took the opposite point of view, which is that labeling is really about front whether GMO food should be around and eaten or not, right? No one is really arguing, I want them labeled just because I want public information. People are wanting them labeled because they hope it's interpreted as a warning. So um, again, this is just the assertion in the this thought experiment instead. And therefore, you know, it's entirely a question of whether it's legitimate to have a warning or not, which is partly a science question, right? Because then you can decide how much risk and all these other things. But it, it puts science more at the center of it than the framing I had earlier. So we set up a debate with two scientists, one arguing for and one arguing against. How's, what's the public supposed to do with that? What are the, and what are the responsibilities of the scientists in that kind of debate at that point. So, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, it's a really good issue, and it's a good question, but I don't think really it's a Solomon choice, Solomon-like choice, because we can, we in fact do have labeling, you know, we have labeling because we have labeling with organic foods, and in a sense, the consumer does have some choice. But it's either, it's not no labeling or labeling, Labeling can be done at any time by any company, 
in a voluntary way. I think the problem is the mandatory labeling and the threshold because that's where you perceive, get the perception of something negative or this is something harmful. I think that's really the issue. The second issue is do we have public policy, I don't have an answer for this, do we have public policy by popular election? And I think that if we do, in terms of like food and things that are related to science, then you can conjure up all kinds of things where we could have a law that says that, you know, let's not vaccinate any of our kids or let's not do genetic screening, which is mandated in all the different states. So I think it's a, it's a really complicated issue, but I think there is a middle ground. And I think the middle ground is say, okay, well, let's just put a label on these things and let's do it voluntarily and let's inform the public that, you know, these Doritos have some genetically engineered materials in them, whether it's safe or not safe, we could debate in another way. But let's not mandate that you can't have more than 0.9% of this thing uh, because that conjures up something very, very negative. And in fact, I think it is true that your choices will be less uh, because the company is just not going to have the genetically engineered stuff. It's just going to go away. So this is a science point, but obviously the voluntary system could actually create more confusion and more openness for actually deliberately misleading and could in some ways alienate the public more than a government system. Well, but look at the natural food industries. There's no regulation at all. And look at all the claims about ginkgo biloba. Right. In fact, there's a law that says that there's no FDA oversight of anything that's sold by the natural food industry. Right. And so, I mean, this is the kind of climate that we're working in. Right. Um, Bill, did you want to add or other people want to jump in on this? Eric? Yeah. I guess I look at all these again. As a scientist, I'm, I'm asking other questions. Um, if we were to take the premise and it were to lead to uh, the decision to put less GM ingredients on the on the grocery store, store shelf, then you know I'm starting to back up, go up the channel. It's like okay, that means farmers are going to need to plant less GM crops because those products are not going to find it all the way to the consumer. All right, so if they plant less GM crops, what, what are the consequences of that? What were the benefits that farmers were receiving and the environment was receiving from growing those crops? We'll have to forego those benefits. So now we need to have another conversation around the consequences of going back and growing crops a more traditional way, bringing back more chemistry, you know, losing some of the benefits from conservation tillage and greenhouse gas reductions and a lot of other debated topics. And so it's not as simple as let's make a choice on whether we label. There, everything, you've got to peel the onion. There's a lot of other questions that need to be asked associated with it. So that, in a way, is an argument for more scientific participation in the debate in some ways, although it's even more fraught tomorrow. Yeah, I'm now, uh, let's talk about utility. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that what Eric just said is sort of the crux of this. Because what you think about labeling and whether you think it's a good idea or it's not sort of depends entirely on what you think is going to happen as a result of it. And so will farmers plant fewer GM crops and that will have some consequences? Or will consumers just stick with their Doritos and everything just stays the same? And so unless we can answer that question with some kind of certainty, we have no idea what the impact of these is going to be. And I'm going to make the argument that we can't answer that question with any kind of certainty. And when you look at the predictions for what the consequences are going to be, what you find is that people who oppose labeling think, think that they will make the world a better place, and people who, who support labeling, with the, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the prediction for what's going to happen in the world depends entirely on the worldview of the predictor. And that's a problem. Right, although that could be a recipe for doing nothing on any issue, right? If you take it to its logical extreme. Right. Um, Bill, Bill, do you want to jump in and then Bob? Yeah. Sure. So again, it goes back to this issue of ecology that I was talking about this morning, the ability to predict the intended and unintended consequences of particular actions. And you know, on an issue like labeling GMOs, we, we're at a particular point in time where there are a relatively restricted number of events that, that are out there. And we're only talking about a relatively few number of products. But if we label now, we're setting regulation 
at, you know, for essentially everything else that comes uh, after. And for me, you know, there's an issue of, of not enough information. So if you simply, about not enough information about so so if we had GMO label a GMO label all that says is that one of the ingredients in there was produced through a particular kind of technology it doesn't actually tell me anything about why the thing was or or what the particular benefit is to whom to what and there you know do a sort of a thought of experiment so if you are unhappy with the idea of Roundup Ready whatever, because you don't like the idea of pesticides. Um, but you're OK with the idea of BT whatever, because in theory it reduces, uh, sorry, uh, Roundup Ready because of herbicides, BT, uh, because it may, in fact, reduce the risks, uh, reduce the amount of pesticides. We can argue whether that's true or not. I, I don't want to do that. Um, but in one case, you'd be pro, I, I'd like to have GM. In the other case, maybe not so much, but you don't necessarily know what is what. And further down the road, we may be developing additional kinds of crops that have particular health benefits, for example. Um, and just saying may contain GMOs or contains GMOs isn't enough information. Reminds me of a New Yorker cartoon from maybe a decade ago with a diner where it had like the breakfast menu and for each item it had risks, benefits. So um, this is hard to know. Anyway, Bob. Yeah, I was just going to say tomorrow that I think we do have maybe, I think we do have a model, and that's a European model. And I think that shows the consequences of very strict regulations on labeling of GM products. And I think uh, for those of us that were around in the beginning, uh, the first GM products were on the market in Europe before they were on the market in the United States. And there was generalized public acceptance of those because a lot of education went into saying what they were. And so you see the consequences of um, a high degree of political politicalization of the of the science. You see the consequences of a very strict labeling and the consequences have very, very, very indirect effects that we don't think about. For example, what about the lack of development of this technology in Africa? Uh, because a lot of the African nations uh, export their food to Europe and therefore won't use the technology uh, because they're not going to be able to ship their products to market. That has a very strong uh, indirect and, and negative effect on uh, technological training of people in, under, uh, in undeveloped parts of the world. So I think that the European model is a very onerous model, and it shows how public opinion can go from being very positive, because I think if one <coughs> studies the history of plant genetic engineering, you'll see from 1983 to 1996, it was very positive. You look, pick up any magazine you want, Newsweek, Time, The Economist, any newspaper is very positive in terms of these effects. And then all of a sudden, it changed overnight and became very onerous in Europe. So uh, I shudder to think that that would happen in the United States. And one final comment is that in some respects, it has happened in the United States because, um, and you don't see this, but I do. Uh, try and start a company right now uh, that might use genetic engineering uh, to improve some food of some kind. I will guarantee you that you won't find one cent of entrepreneurial money to be able to find that, start that company. But yet in the beginning, there were lots of companies, little tiny companies that did a lot of really good stuff. This is a really major consequence of, um, of this debate, uh, which has been, as I think I've pointed out today, uh, very negatively centered and not really centered uh, on, on what really the facts are and what are the consequences. So I think we have to take this labeling thing out of a very narrow kind of uh, should we label or not, and, and as was just said very eloquently, put it in a much bigger context. Um, I have students at UCLA that say to me, I really love plant biology. I really love the science you're doing. But I'm not going to put up with the kinds of debates and arguments you know, that are going on in this field. And we're losing, and I see it on the front line, a lot of really bright kids. Uh, and so there's a lot of indirect consequences of this thing. Uh, that, that go way beyond uh, labeling and all these other issues. Right, and of course someone from the other side could say that's exactly the signal we want to say. Plant that's biologists right. should be doing something else with their, with their knowledge, right? So 
Um, so let me, um, I think we have illustrated though, like, again, the breadth of, you know, how quickly even, you know, what's meant by science changes when you start having this conversation. Allison, did you want to add something and then I'll open no, up to the audience? Okay, um, we have some more time and we can talk here, but let's open it up, go ahead. So um, I'm, my name is Todd Kukin from the Woodrow Wilson Center and I'd like to maybe get to this question of when science and citizens actually connect. So one of the things we work on is with the DIY bio community and the rise of community labs. So I'm curious of your thoughts of how this discussion changes when you actually put the technology in the hands of the public in a real public engagement type of activity since the technology now has enabled that to happen. Interesting question, certainly. Um, sure, Bob, go ahead, start. You know, in answer to your question, uh, I've been involved in some really, really good public dialogues. Uh, public dialogues on genetic engineering open in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York. Uh, and, and it's really, uh, it, it, from my point of view, it's very heartening that when you, you always have the extremes, of course, the people that uh, are going to shout and yell and everything. But I think when you get an organic farmer together with a conventional farmer, together with someone who does genetic engineering such as myself, together with other aspects of, of the public together, and they communicate their different points of view to the public, I think the response is really positive. I think it's, it's, it's long forgotten here that in the beginning of genetic engineering, uh, the origins in 1973, there was huge outcry about genetic engineering and now we're going to take genes from one species and put them into another species. And this was in the, in the, in the heat of the Vietnam War and, and, and the demonstrations were enormous and there were massive demonstrations uh, and arguments against genetic engineering. Uh, but the point that I want to make was that there was this thing called uh, the recombinant DNA committee. And the recombinant DNA committee consisted of scientists, lay people, citizens, people from industry, and the facts were put out in front of this committee and they came up with a very rational, very rational system to be able to move forward on this. And there was in fact a moratorium for two years in which there was no genetic engineering done in the United States. But after that moratorium, there are very specific guidelines. And so I'm very optimistic that if you engage the public in a rational way, and you have different stakeholders that are involved with different opinions has been brought out here today that one can come up with a, a solution that maybe can't satisfy the extremes but in general can satisfy most of the people because in general I think what we want is good science to move forward uh, for the progress of humanity and for all of us. I think that's what we all want. So let me um, add something and then continue to throw that the questions. Um, inquiry to everybody. So um, two things. One, in terms of sort of a Silomar and all the, the recombinant DNA thing, I mean, that only happened though, right, because there was a clear threat that there was going to be regulation, right? So if there's, um, or at least a sense that there was regulation, that's often the case. If people say voluntary systems are great, and they can be, but often the only reason you have a voluntary system is because there's a backstop of something else, either coming or actually there. Um, and so does that change anything? And, and I thought the question was partly about that if the actual technology to, to create biotech is broadly available, you know, like 3D printing, whatever, but that, you know, that people in their home labs can do something with biotechnology, how does that change the situation? Um, is that more of a call for regulation? Because now, you know, who do you even get to have a voluntary agreement if it's everybody, sort of the way that journalism has changed? Or, um, or is that, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom and, you know, see how things go and sort of a libertarian wonderland, which is always the libertarian you nightmare know? to me. But anyway, um, <laughs> can I make one point about it? Real quickly more? and then we'll go to yeah. tomorrow, sure. I, I, I don't think you're correct about the threat of regulation. Okay. Um, in reality, it was because Paul Berg, who won the Nobel Prize for genetic engineering, was going to do an experiment by taking a gene from a human tumor virus and putting it into a bacteria. And another scientist uh, on the other side of the coast, on the east coast here, got wind of that and objected to that experiment. And Paul Berg thought about that and wrote a letter to science and said, you know, we really don't know what the potential hazards of this technology is. We ought to convene 
and have a meeting to discuss whether or not there are potential hazards. And out of that came all of the NIH guidelines and everything else, even though down the stream there were hearings and things like that. But I don't think it was a threat of regulation in the beginning. It was the scientists themselves. Um, Okay, so well, tomorrow, Allison, um, I'll just say I, I like stories where someone from the East Coast is the hero. But anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow first. I actually think the dissemination of the technology is going to solve this problem for us because the nature of a very expensive, difficult to develop new technology uh, is such that, in agriculture at any rate, its first deployment is going to be on corn and soy because that's where the money is. And you guys have to make your investment back. And it makes perfect sense that if you can genetically engineer a crop, you're going to genetically engineer the crop that's on the most acres. And so any new t technology is going to sort of represent a double down on industrialization by its very nature. But as soon as those patents start to expire, as soon as those techniques go mainstream and different people can experiment with different crops and different genes and different traits, all of a sudden we have organisms that, that do benefit public health, that do benefit the, the, uh, our, our ecology. And you know, Roundup Ready Soy, for a lot of reasons is hard to love. Um, but, but, you know, my American chestnut or my GMO yeast mine, I, because I've taken them under my journalistic wing, um, that, that, that produces omega-3 fats, these are things that are much easier to love. And so I think the dissemination of this technology into basically people's garages is in the long run what's going to change the face of genetic modification. Okay, um, look, great. So, um, Allison, then Eric. Okay. Yeah, I just want to get back to Todd's question, which I think had to do with literal garages of people doing genetic engineering in their garages, and also undergraduate students going to these international genetically engineered machine, it's called iGEM conferences and winning prizes, um, which is, it's great from a point of view ed of education, also the Glowing Plant Project. Um, you know, people are learning about DNA, they're getting excited about science, I really love that. But any time these organisms can survive on their own in the environment, I think we need to be, make sure there's some kind of regulations that make sure they pass through some kind of scrutiny because we can't just go throwing organisms out in the environment. That is just going to be an environmental disaster in the long term. Gives new meaning to invasive species. Um, Eric. I, w I wanted to build, build on Tamar's point because I, I think she left one thing out that is important. <laughs> Just one thing. Um, you know, you implied that intellectual property was the barrier and once that, you know, once that was over that this could move into the, to, to the real world and everyone could use this technology and familiarity would bring support and acceptance. But the, the barrier is regulation. So even though intellectual property does not exist, I mean, the reason the public sector is, mu is not much more engaged and we don't see many more products on smaller crops and smaller uses is because of the cost of the, of the regulation and the uncertainty associated with the regulatory process, which goes all the way back to the investment dollar uh, that we were, Bob was talking about. So the, and the reason why the large acreage crops and the big six companies are engaged is because you know, the footprint of these crops is so large they can bear the investment mm -hmm. and the risk. That's a good point. And so, so in, in the regulatory costs, while large, are small relative to the, the opportunity, the benefit that comes from using the technology at the farm level and even beyond that. The jobs created, you know, by the, by the, the products that are being produced and sold and so on. So I, I only make that point clear because Ultimately, the conversation needs to be about the level of regulation that is appropriate for this technology. Back in 1973, the discussion around a similar conference and the decisions were made that at that time were made in a large part because people didn't know. There was not a lot of data. There was a lot, not a lot of experience. At that time, the prediction was oh, in 20 years or so, we will have filled those data gaps up and we can lower the, re you know, the regulatory burden 
and we can really regulate only those things that are really new and risky and not continue to regulate things that we've We've now got 25 years of data that shows us they're safe, but we still regulate them the same way we did 25 years ago. So it's that regulation that is really the barrier for, I think, an expansion and use of this technology, not intellectual property. So that obviously raises a lot of scientific and political questions. We'll continue this if we don't have more questions from the audience. So I want to, yeah, teacher. So I was hoping to come back to the, uh, to the question of labeling one more time. Um, and I was a little bit surprised that the voluntary labeling discussion was so hypothetical because I think we do have voluntary labeling in place right now, and that says no GMOs on you know, cereal on various other things. Um, and, and of course, there's a clear motivation for having that, and it's done in part, and it, you know, that motivation is partly shown by the non-trivial campaign contributions in the California example, for instance, that are made by the organic food industry for whom that's a profit producer, the no GMO label. Um, or at least that's one way of looking at it. And I was hoping to get others from the, from the committee. I mean, we do actually have voluntary labeling. There is clearly foods are labeled related to GMOs. What does that do? What are the motivations? What's the benefit? And, and any other things that we should be thinking about? That's, that's because I didn't get a chance, but, um, but, that, but, 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 that's, but, that, but that's okay. Um, so it's a really interesting question. Um, our data suggests that people don't actually know what the regulatory uh, landscape actually is. The average consumer um, doesn't know that we don't have mandatory labeling. Our data suggests, you know, if you ask, uh, is there mandatory labeling in the United States, only 26% of the population is able to say no. So they assume that there actually is mandatory labeling now. Um, that's not quite the answer to your question about the voluntarily, voluntary labeling. Um, the data also suggests that most people don't understand that the organic standard also does not permit GM ingredients, although you know, what, what th you know, there's no threshold level that's actually mentioned in those particular standards. So they don't know that either. Um, so what they're left with is uh, risk communication through what I like to refer to as what is free is best. So you end up with GMO free, uh, clone free, uh, my favorite which is chemical free which is a metaphysical impo you know, impossibility, um, you know, BPA free, cruelty free, antibiotic free and, and that suggests um, that there is some superiority to that particular you know, product. We also know that uh, the, you know, the GMO free label seems to, to work better with particular products. Um, no one has an expectation, for example, that, I was going to name a product, I, I, I shouldn't, um, that you know, a, a particularly, um, uh, a chocolate cake, for example, that one might buy in a small package in a convenience store, no one's particularly worried that that might have you know, GMO ingredients. On the other hand, if they're you know, trying to get a, a granola bar, they may care deeply about whether it's whole grain and natural and whatever. Um, you know, we even know that there are differences within, within particular brands, even within, within a company. So you know, GMO-free may make sense for a particular brand, but, but not for other, uh, for, for other kinds of things. So I'm not sure if that completely answers it, but it's, but it's a start. Quick question, sort of building on what Eric had said and also what Allison has said as far as regulation goes, because Allison seems to be concerned that anything new should be regulated, and Eric is talking more about, you know, making the sense of the regulation. My question is if you are able to, through particularly some of the, the new technologies, to be able to create something that could easily be done by natural breeding, or since we know the genomes of, say, the I'm an animal person, so I'll use the cow, um, of what causes horns to exist in cows or not. If you remove that from a dairy cow and can produce something that could be created, already, it's already there in the national ge um, genome of the animal. What is your thoughts about regulation for that? Is that something that you're concerned about? Yeah, yeah, because you were the... experiments out into their neighborhood. I, I don't have any comment about regulations, but let, I'm sure other people do. <laughs> Would you buy horn-free milk? <laughs> no, I'm still stuck on uh, gluten-free chicken. But. 
<laughs> what about gluten-free water? Um, we can talk forever about regulation. I actually That's want to come back to the question. question on regulation, but if depending on what time, we, much time we have. But Rick, why don't you go? This may be a quick one. So I, I've been watching all of your message strategies in this conversation today and thinking about this morning that, and the takeaway from this morning, one of them was that people are very rational about how they make decisions. And hearing this afternoon, Bob's continuing very passionate refrain is that it's just not rational not to believe in GMOs. And I wanted to ask the other natural scientists here if that's part of their message strategy, and then pulse the social scientists here in the room if there is any chance that that's an effective message strategy. <laughs> Good work. Um, sure, go ahead, Aaron. We'll do the um, natural science, just I'm so Bill knows we'll get to him. We're going to do natural sciences first, then social sciences, no, just I, to I, keep with the usual hierarchy. I think it's a, I think it's a great question because I, I've said it over and over again, even back, back in St. Louis to my colleagues that, that kind of will ask a similar kind of question. I believe virtually every decision we make is rational. You know, at some level, you're making a decision based on, on your own sorts of reasoning and rationale. Uh, and to others, it looks like the wrong decision, but to you, it, it may be the right decision. Um, I, I think, you know, as a scientist, I'm constantly, though, asking what are the factors that are relevant to any decision that, that can be made? And I think most people have a much narrower set of things that they consider relevant to their decision making than I might as a scientist. And I think part of our role as, in, as, as scientists is to help people to, to identify the various you know, kind of consequences of their decision-making process. There are benefits to the technology. It wouldn't be developed without and used so widely if it wasn't bringing benefits. Do they understand what they are? I think it was said earlier this morning that one of the decisions in Europe you know, to oppose GM was because there were no benefits at all. It was nothing but either perceived or, or, or expected risk. So it's a no-brainer what decision you make under that scenario. But there, are re there really are positive impacts, and so people need to explore those better, and I think that's, that's where I go. Bill, you want to take the social science side? Representing the social scientists, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a well-known fact that, that my, my brother Steve hates peas. And in April, he will have spent nearly five decades hating peas, despite the fact that we had a set of parents who told him that peas were really good for him. Um, you know, we don't need to be in, in a situation where the scientists are seen as the, the authoritative parents saying you should eat your peas because they're perfectly safe and they're, and they're good for you. We have to have more of a conversation than that. So, can, but did, did your brother, does your brother still think that, or, that peas actually aren't good for you, right? Because that's, that's what makes this, I mean, you know, adding Mendel to the debate changes that, right? I mean, then the debate's about, they're telling you something that's not, not only am I not going to do it because I just don't like the taste, they're, or the texture, they are, you know, telling me something that isn't true. So is that, where, does, does the family metaphor hold all the way through? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Elaborate. He, it, sure, sure. So, so he would argue that, that peas are probably great for me. And he still asks when I serve beef stew, are there peas in this? And that, I think that sort of you know, elaborates the, the metaphor here. So um, you know, as, as incomplete as it may be. Um, so to, to, to kind of go, go back to an earlier question, um, you know, this issue of um, if we democratize the technology to the point where people can actually do it in their garages, you know, what's the likely impact of that? And should we regulate that? Well, I can't actually focus on the regulatory side. But I think from the public perception side, um, one of the things that scientists have going for them, um, believe it or not, is that people tend to think that they know what they're doing. Um, and you know, one of the great things about Asilomar was it was actually a demonstration that the scientists involved shared values with the rest of society. And that was a great thing to, to have happen. Um, so I've been at this a long time. One of the first uh, articles I, I wrote was published um, actually in Nature Biotechnology and then I was interviewed by Genetic Engineering News, which I think is Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. 
And, and, and in 1995, I'm quoted as saying something like, in the battle over genetically modified foods, most of the shots have been fired over the, the heads of the non-combatants, which I think is still true now. And then I, I'm, I'm, I'm quoted as saying, um, when people think about breeding new plants and animals, they want to believe that someone like Luther Burbank or George Washington Carver is involved, not P.T. Barnum. That's true. <laughs> and I still think that that holds as well. And so if you can do it in your garage, you know, my brother-in-law is an idiot. I have no I, you know, I don't want him screwing around with this. You know. Maybe you could make a pea that tastes good to your brother, though. Um, absolutely. And then I've got a last question for everybody. Quick, that you know, one of the things that we talked about this morning is that one of the things that is compelling to people are you know stories about people and and the democratization of this is going to help. But you know, one of the roles I think that you know the, the idea that people do trust scientists and that science is really important here, and you know, someone like Bob with this better canola is is a really good, compelling story. And, and so that story may be able to help change people's minds without taking it to its natural conclusion that these things are safe and better. Because I think, you know, at some level, people think being able to make stuff better is pretty cool and science is really powerful. And, and I don't think there is a, ran uh, the rampant anti-science bias about it. And I, so I think scientists can play a very valuable role. That's what I'm trying to say. So for, I think this, those are important. I mean, I think as, again, back to what um, Dan, among can other I people, demonstrated. Can you say something for one minute? Yeah, yeah. You know, on, on an optimistic note, I was on the, uh, wasn't too long ago, I was on the Larry King show. And I was being screamed at, literally, uh, by a famous cook and a famous actress and a famous basketball player. And I was the only scientist trying to argue in a rational way. And at the end of the show, Larry King saw that I was kind of beaten down, which I was walking out sort of quietly. And he said, Professor, I always go with the science. <laughs> and who could represent the public better than Larry King? So, <laughs> the, um, so it's also, it's actually P.T. Barnum's an interesting figure to bring up since he famously, at least supposedly said, there's a sucker born every minute, which sort of in some ways is, is there and which person is it is sort of the underlying question here in some ways. Um, so um, first of all, I think Tamara's point again, hammering home that the public gut in some abstract way, you know, has almost, you know, I picked this religious faith in science, right, across the board. And, um, and so it's sort of scientists to lose in a way in those, in those debates is an important one to remember. So on regulation came up, I'm trying to think how to ask this that's broad enough but not too broad. But so often the question of how much regulation is enough, right? What's the role, let me, I'll ask him, what's the role of the scientists in that? How do you, as a scientist, if someone just said, all right, what's the level of regulation we need, which obviously had, a, well, this is partly giving the answer, right, which assumes there's some agreement in values in terms of what level of risk is okay to accept, um, as well as what the risk is, how do you handle that? I mean, and do you, as a scientist, how do you start distinguishing in that debate when you're really talking, feel you're talking more on scientific grounds and when you're going beyond that? Why don't we just quickly go down the um, row on that, Allison? Well, I'm gonna um, give a very easy answer, which is I think no regulation is not sufficient. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Eric. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the weight of regulation is an important topic. And it is not simple. It's complex. It is holding back the progress and application of, of a process, a modern process that could be much On more purpose. widely used. Um, the, the question of, of how much is appropriate, um, I, I'll give an example. Um, there's a, it's often said that People have concerns, so we need to regulate more. Ask for more data, more time, more review. And uh, I don't know that I've ever seen the study, and I'd love my social science colleagues here to point me to one or maybe think about doing one. But whether or not it's true 
that more regulation actually leads to greater comfort and acceptance that something is okay and safe. I would argue that it's just the opposite. And so the more we regulate or as we continue to regulate a field that we're increasingly learning more and more about, and many of the uncertainties that we had 25 years ago uh, have been answered today, uh, what we're doing is we're perpetuating a, a scenario where, where the technology is not going to be as widely used and we're, we're feeding the controversy. So two and, things on that. Real, one is, so part of the question is, you know, and I won't ask you it because we'll keep going, but you know, again, as a scientist, I mean, what part of that, you know, the si that's sort of not, that's a sort of social science historical economic concern. I will say, historians feel there's a lot of evidence that actually it's made a huge difference in terms of making the public feel safe across the broad. And after this, I'm going to have to miss part of the session because I've got to go up to Capitol Hill and talk about a chemical bill where the industry is dying to have a regulatory regime because it, there's no markers now for where they can say, like with, they can with the FDA, that, hey, somebody who was disinterested could say this was safe. But that, that's a big issue that's not sort of a natural science issue, um, at least not exclusively. Uh, to, I, but I yeah. do need to clarify, I'm not arguing for no regulation. Yeah, no, I'm understood. arguing for the appropriate level of regulation. Right. Yeah. So on the role, not so much on the role of regulation, but how scientists fit into that both natural and social scientists fit into that discussion as a reporter who obviously has to think about this. I don't have the foggiest idea. Okay. <laughs> That's, your no is going to seem really definitive after that. But go <laughs> so I, I think uh, the question really is how much regulation is enough. Right. And that's essentially what we're and we're to what saying. extent is that a science and question? And to what extent is that a science question? And to what is that, you know, to what extent uh, is a social science or, or a political question? Right. You know, I, I don't have the data to actually give you an empirical answer, and so I won't. Okay. So you don't have the foggy study either. <laughs> Sometimes uh, that's the most important answer, right? <laughs> he articulated. <laughs> um, good. It's always good to end the panel as people are getting punchy. Um, Bob, and then I'll make a final comment. I, I think the answer to your question is I think we have some really great examples. Uh, to Eric's question. Your, to mine. your okay. question. Uh, one of the best examples is that people may or may not know, uh, but there are human GMOs that are walking around today and that are only alive because they have a gene in them that they weren't born with, using exactly the same technology as to make GM crops. And that field of gene therapy uh, has always been very strictly regulated, as it should be, because you're dealing with humans. Uh, but the amount of regulation has gone, uh, has become less and less and less and less as the technology has shown that it's been not safe, I mean, you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but there's a lot less concerns than there were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I think we also have an example of genetic engineering per se. Uh, in the beginning, there were a lot of regulations. There were P4, P3, P2, all kinds of levels of containment, um, millions and millions of dollars being spent on uh, labs that you could only do genetic engineering in, and all those regulations are, are now gone completely for the most part. And the reason is, is because people have done, scientists, very good studies, there have been thousands of them, that have shown that the concerns that were put on the table in the beginning are no longer a concern uh, because the science shows that there aren't these problems. It hasn't borne those kinds of, of, of predictions. And so I think, yes, we need to have appropriate regulations, but when the science is clear, and when it shows that something is, let's say, perfectly safe for the environment or at the bench or whatever, then I think those regulations have to go by the wayside because they do become a stumbling block, a big one, to the application of science for the good of humanity. Great. Thanks. So um, this reminded of the, there's a Kurt Vonnegut essay where he defined the information revolution as the idea that people could actually know what they're talking about if they really wanted to. Um, and I think, you know, part of the... Um, the message of, of today is that actually it's not that simple. Um, I think I want to thank the panel. I thought it was a very rich discussion that not only gave us some ideas on uh, science and communication and the science policy interface, but also illustrated um, 
just through the conversation, the difficulties of sort of navigating it and figuring out where the lines are and what science, what isn't, where they intersect, the, where social science fits in, where natural sciences do. So um, hopefully that was helpful to everybody, and thanks again. Thank you.